We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Welcome everybody, it's Steve with Cespedelli, coming at you once again with Ryan Grant from Mediatrics Press with an update on his Bellman project and the Alphonsus project. Ryan, as always, welcome brother, and how you doing? I'm doing all right, thank you. How about yourself? I'm good, I'm good. Got a little bit of the sniffles right now, but I will persevere through. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Three days so, will emerge, you know, <laughs> completely healed, resurrected. <laughs> I need some Hydro Power Queen or whatever it is. <laughs> we can't say the official name. I know what it is before in my comments saying, you, you idiot, don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, we could, I don't want to get blocked. I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. I uh, just turned Thank Trump you. into an Italian mobster. I don't know. Uh, so, <laughs> Bellamin, uh, what are you working on next on the Bellamin series? Well, the next thing, or maybe we should re recap, there's probably some people watching this video that have no idea who the heck St. Robert Bellarmine is or why he wrote or what he what he was important. So St. Robert Bellarmine was a 16th century Jesuit born in 1542, uh, back when that was a good thing, actually, being a Jesuit. And he uh, became basically the father of apologetics in the Catholic tradition, because what he did is i mean he had time he was a brilliant student incredibly intelligent photographic memory he said that he could memorize a sermon about an hour's length by reading it once and so he applied that to, to memorizing so many texts of the fathers and even even the protestants when he was in uh, leuven in belgium he was able to read what the protestants had wrote so he was able to actually understand what they were arguing and then cite them accurately and in context in order to you know arrange the scripture and the fathers to to oppose them so he got sent back to Rome and he was teaching a class there and some bishops and, and, and others were in the class and saying, wow, this guy's brilliant. And they tried to do this a couple of times to get a chair of apologetics. Back then they called it controversial theology. That's what they called it. So you, uh, you know, and they, it had failed and they had some fairly accomplished theologians try it, but they, they, they hadn't made the class work. So Bellarmine comes in and, he, and because he has his mastery of the fathers as well as what the Protestants wrote, he's able to come up with any topic you like on the board, scripture, tradition, pope, you know, sacraments. And as this is what the Protestants taught on this, and they go, I mean, obviously it would just be one that given day, and then, or one aspect of it. And he said, now here's what they argue, here's the, they argue for their support from scripture. Now here's what the fathers say, boom, 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 boom. And just had able to lay out the clear arguments refuting why they were wrong. He goes in through the history. He's really good friends with Cardinal Baronius, who is uh, really the founder of church history. Actually, we got a book on that too. If you want to get that uh, for on the shameless plug alert, <laughs> um, can't go wrong with that book either. So Bellarmine, you know, is doing this class. So cardinals are there, bishops are, you know, sitting. In. It's like standing room only, and they're like, wow. And they go to the Pope Gregory the Thirteenth and tell him about how awesome this. His young Jesuits classes are. So Gregory the 13th gets with the Jesuit superior general, Aquaviva, and he says, all right, you need to get that guy writing a book. And next thing you know, but you know, Bellarmine never intended to ever write a book. Actually, what he, he thought he was going to be doing was, was preaching, because that's what he had a calling for. That's what people, you know, and that, that's what he figured he'd be doing. And instead, it's like, nope, you're going to be writing. And that's more or less what he's doing the rest of his life, um, except for a short stint as a bishop which he actually rather enjoyed and he was very good at, we might add. So with the, the controversies then is, is a, a bunch of massive tomes. And I'll pull my original copy. Sorry about that. I should have had it at the ready. Sorry. So this is a massive folio from 1721. So you get the scale of it. Now this is the third volume of it on the sacraments. Uh, now there are there are four of these, I try to be careful with this because it is 300 years old. Um, so there are four of these. The first one 
um, you know, it, and they're all called the controversies, day controversies. They're literally disputations on the day controversies, on the controversies of the Christian faith, with that nice subtitle, Against the Heretics of Our Time, i.e. the Protestants. <laughs> Back, uh, you love the old language, right? Um, even my Protestant friends actually appreciate the old language because they're like, hey, at least you're clear about what you believe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, anyway, the first uh, controversy then that begins is, well, basically on authority and it's on scripture. So what does scripture, you know, is scripture the sole authority which uh, judges controversy? And then, then there's all, all these other considerations because he's aiming to refute all of the Protestants teaching. And so he begins basically citing scripture itself and how the church fathers understood the scripture. And so his practice there in all these things is to basically take a topic and what does the scripture say? And how did the fathers understand? How was this understood through the life and history of the church? All right. So the antiquity of this idea, this doctrine, it's the consensus of the fathers and so many things and he engages his own exegesis, which is actually very his scriptural exegesis, which is fantastic on so many different points. And likewise, he moves on and on uh, <clears throat> the notion of tradition, what tradition is, and how tradition assists in governance. But ultimately, you still need a judge of faith. And who's that? So then the next book is on Christ. Now, it covers all sorts of issues in Christology, places where various Protestants erred in the notion of who Christ is and how he continues to live with the church throughout you know, time. And so the conclusion, essentially, when you're done with all that is, of course, Christ is the head of the church. So Christ is the judge of controversies, technically, but not as he was when he visibly walked on the earth. So who is the judge of controversies? And then comes to that next book, which actually made up our, our first kind of opera omnia volume, the, uh, the Pope. So then he writes this massive 700 page thing on the papacy. And that, uh, you know, covers all these different aspects of, uh, you know, whether, you know, do Christ can sign, what kind of government is the best form of government is actually the first argument in the book. Because John Calvin argues, and he's the first one in the whole tradition to do it, that aristocracy and therefore republicanism are the best forms of government. And Bellarmine says no. In fact, he goes to attack those as often as he can. He you know, is often described as being republican in political thought. And it's, it's largely a misreading of his notion of the origins of political authority in terms of later ideas, which are not exactly what he's getting at, even though he is very much against divine right of kings. But he says monarchy is the best system of government. And at that, a mixed monarchy, when it's been or, or tempered, as the Latin puts it, so that you have elements of aristocracy and elements of democracy, that, that this would ideally be the best government. And this is what Christ gave the church. And then again, he needs to defend that principle because the idea back then is, well, God would only give the best form of government to the church, right? Right. Well, you know, monarchy is the best form of government, right? Yes. So therefore, that's what he gave to the church. And that's why Calvin argues the, the converse, that republicanism is best, because that matches his vision of the church as being these kind of presbyters' councils and so many things. So anyway, so this is kind of the course that Bellarmine takes. And then and it continues on the church. We'll go through all these that I've, that I've got translated on the church. And in different aspects, like on councils, on the, what the church is, the church militant, and then the, the marks of the church. He has another book that I haven't translated yet on particular members of the church. It's on clergy, not monks, and the last one's on lady. The one on lady has been translated for a while um, already. And then it would begin again on purgatory, we, which we've got on canonization, veneration of the saints. And there's a couple other books I passed over on relics and images. Um, late, earlier this year, I did his treatise on the mass. So to answer the question of what we're working on right now, we're working on the treatise on the sacraments in general. So which is a lengthier treatise, which basically considers kind of your notion of the sacraments, its etymology, the way the Protestants erred on the, on the sacraments and it defends the Catholic teaching. You know, what is a sacrament? You know, from your Baltimore catechism, right? You know, it confers, it's a, it's a visible sign conferring interior um, invisible grace, right? It's the instrumental cause of justifying grace in that way. And so going through defending that kind of position, what's ex opere operato, this term you see, this Latin term that shows up in the sacraments. And, um, you know, so many different elements dealing with, you know, what the sacraments are and refuting the Protestant errors on them. And so it's, it's, it's a lengthier treatise, but it's useful. Then he gets eventually to ceremonies. Can you have ceremonies at mass? Why is mass in Latin? Because of course, when he wrote in the 16th century, that was the case. 
And I think he makes a very good argument for why it should be the case still even. But beside that, um, and he's speaking specifically in the Roman Rite. So Byzantine Catholics, Eastern Catholics, don't, don't freak out. <laughs> he's not talking about you because he actually venerates the linguistic traditions of the Eastern churches too. All right, so. Um, and he's good for uh, these days too. He's not just a historical book that you want to read for somebody living in that time. I mean, the book on Christ, for example, I know you don't have it, but I mean, you can use that for J-dubs and Mormons. Um, and it's not like reading the phone book. He's got some quips in there too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it, and the thing is, it's not some dry, archaic theological text, um, even though modern uh, theologians might like to describe it so, because they can. Um, <laughs> It was really, if anything's archaic, their stuff is totally stuck in the 1960s. But um, for Bellarmine, you know, he, he's very witty. He had a great humor and a great wit, and he always loved a touch of humor to put up things. And so uh, to, to put through various conversations, so he'll get whenever he can get a witty joke in, he will. Right. So, so it actually becomes fun in that way. He has a lot of great lines. It's actually enjoyable to read in that way. Um, you know, he and, and that his actual the import of his theological teaching as well is not even though it's from the 16th century, it's not useless. It's not something that has been all superseded. We don't need this anymore. I mean, there are a few points in which theologians argue a different way, uh, even before the council or that subsequent uh, subsequent councils to him, which would have been Vatican One and Vatican Two, might have you know moved the conversation where his work is good as a seminal thought. But you need to look at the other stuff to get the whole picture. And there's some things like that that are true. But in general, a lot of it really is just the fathers. And also systematizing people who in those times uh, where we're known theologians and putting into the better art parts of their, their work that he agreed with, kind of synthesizing all these things together and going through so many arguments. And so, they, and, and there's, also, so there's a lot of stuff that's not his own original thought that he puts together as his kind of original thought. So anyway... So, you know, most of my way through the sacraments in general, you know, sections going to that actually with the editors right now. Then um, following that is the treatise on baptism and on confirmation. So on baptism, the nature of the sacrament, does it, um, you know, does it generate and so on and so forth. So, and then confirmation, of course, the argument, is it a sacrament at all? Because the Protestants deny that they'll say, yeah, there was this anointing in the early church, but that wasn't a sacrament. You know, that, that's not really. So Bellarmine defends, of course, from the fathers, who actually are fairly explicit when you get down to the citations he brings, which are accurate, by the way, that, the, uh, that there is such a thing as confirmation. Plus, I mean, the example in the Eastern Church, too, they have it as well. And then second chrismation, they give confirmation with baptism. So, I mean, just quickly, some of these, um, obviously, apart from the name of, of baptism, its form, its necessity, the institution of baptism, um, and we of course got um, certain certain controversies that'll be raised for today uh, on baptism of blood and flame, i.e., on baptism of desire and baptism of blood. Those are the ones that uh, he spends a lengthy number of pages defending it. So that'll get certain people all wound up, I'm <laughs> sure. But um, anyway, on the baptism of infants against the Anabaptists. Here's a curious thing too: a lot of the early Protestants still baptized infants even though their theology would suggest there's no point to it. Uh, so like the Lutherans did always, Calvinist, uh, Calvin himself did, they, he defended baptism of infants. I, I think Calvin might not have accepted the baptism of infants if it wasn't for the Anabaptists, because the Anabaptists were like, no, no, you can never baptize an infant. And he hated them so much, he was like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna keep baptizing infants. You know, so, uh, you know, what are the true or false effects of baptism? Um, does bapt uh, the fact that baptism removes all sin truly removes sins? Um, <clears throat> you know, the baptism does not make men impeccable or that is incapable of sin. And why? You know, these are all kind of questions we still ask today. Well, if I'm baptized, why am I not like perfect? Why is I still, you know, to bring in the discussion of concupiscence? Um, you know, through baptism, men are not freed from the obligation to keep, you know, to keep the law of God, to preserve the law of God. And that's a, an interesting one where you think of um, certain of the early Anabaptists, like John Van Leyden comes to mind in the Netherlands, where 
and basically created this sort of anarchist kingdom, anarchist in the very wrong sense, like really lawless, were, which in the end is never anarchy, really, because they, some idiot makes himself the head, right? And they, there's no law, no one is obeying any law, for, whether it's nature or the gospel or anything else. And, um, you know, it makes, like, think of that, uh, that cardinal in dogma where he says, uh, let the sin begin, right? That's basically what these guys were doing, you know, back in the 16th century. So Don't watch that Bellarmine movie, saying, no. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> through Bellarmine, you know, through an evil movie, by the way. <laughs> but, um, let, uh, you know, you know all, all of these sort of things. So anyway, then we get to, uh, you know, in confirmation on the errors and lies in regard to the sacrament of confirmation. Here's an interesting thing too with Bellarmine. Um, now in those days, uh, controversial theology was a real snake pit. You would have guys um, saying, you know, saying the worst and most unchristian things about their opponents all the time. I'm both Catholic and the Protestant side. Uh, hardly anybody was really immune. I mean, Luther's an obvious example, but even extremely erudite men like the, the English Jesuit Stapleton uh, still can't resist, you know, throwing this or that other, you know, kind of um, off word or off color joke against somebody, uh, uncharitable things. So Bellarmine never stoops to that level. Um, you know, even when people say absolutely impudent, absurd things, he doesn't stoop to that level. The most he'll do is say, you know, so he'll say, but this is a clear lie. And sometimes it is a clear lie because he's looking at it world. Well, He's got the information right in front of him. He just quoted it. Now he's saying the opposite to attack Catholics. So obviously he's lying somewhere or, or you know, because it was also kinder than saying this guy's totally stupid. <laughs> and so, and in which there, there always are people that are pretentious and they're getting into things that probably shouldn't, uh, that are fairly stupid. So it's like, it's hard to, so it's considered more charitable to say that somebody lied because at least they had the cunning and intelligence to try something than to say they were just, they're bad scholars, right? So anyway, so that will all be out in one volume, you know, from this one here. Yeah. Are you making a? Uh, <clears throat> are you making a third version like these two? Yeah. So. So will be the like uh, it won't red, be, it won't blue, be in, and green. Yeah, exactly. It won't be in that order though. Um, so actually, as it is, this one is currently listed as Tomos One. That's volume one. And that's actually going to change to two. So it's going to get uber confusing. I'm going to have to make a more clear list somewhere um, because the one that comes before this is on uh, on scripture and tradition and on Christ. And I am going to eventually do my own version of the reason I skipped it is that you have, um, let's forget his first name, but Baker. I it's Dr. Peter Simpson oh, oh. at uh, Boston College. He has a website where he's done, you know, very scholastic translations of these kind of works for free. So he did on Scripture and on Christ. Shortly after I did on the Roman Pontiff, Father Kenneth Baker did a translation that also had on Scripture and on Christ. So it's already been done twice. It's kind of like, and there's all this other mass that hasn't been done yet. Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't want to pour a lot of time into doing what's already been done. So, and that's one of the reasons why I'm moving forward. So right after this one, would normally be the Thomas uh, three, or actually this one will be three. So four will end up being on those specific members of the church, clergy, monks, and laity, which um, yeah, probably I might do next year. I'll go back and do it. I haven't done it yet. And then the one following that will be the church triumphant, which is on uh, canonization of saints, which I already did in this kind of standalone volume. Mm -hmm. And then the other two sections I didn't do on relics and images. So that'll come out. But the main one that we're at, I'm not sure I'll get that done by Christmas. What I will do is the following volume, which will be what I just described in the sacraments in general, baptism and confirmation. It will have all those. Uh, so it'll be a good 500, 600 pages, I think. And you're we'll doing, uh, you're goes. burning the candle on both ends. You got two doctors of the church are translating. Yeah, so that's, um, I should have brought the books over here. Maybe you got them. The ones on uh, moral theology. I do. So the other project we have, and this one's stalled for a little bit, which I'll explain um, so you have moral theology and volume um, one. Yep, volume, yes, volume one and volume two. Those are massive undertakings as well. So I've got the original for that here as well, although it's much more recent. There we go. So there, although this is a 19 1907 
printing. But anyway, so the moral theology of St. Alphonse is a massive multi-volume work um, where he takes on, uh, the, the first volume, of course, is on law, it's on um, uh, various, uh, on sin itself, the notion of sin, as well as the capital sins, and then on the theological virtues. And then he moves to the Ten Commandments, which is the second volume that you showed. But that only goes commandments one through six, and then he takes the sixth and the ninth together as the last bit. So then the next one's on the seventh commandment, which is on theft. It's a huge, it's bigger than that second volume, just on that one commandment, because it brings in the whole medieval tract, De Justitia Iure, which is literally on um, on justice and law or justice and right, if you want. That's to how thick volume two is. Like... So it's gonna be bigger. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be bigger than that, and it's just on that one commandment on that seventh commandment. So. So in all of these things, it's a, you know it's a, it's a this is a more dry work than Bellarmine number one, and it's also so I just got to put that out there. Um, it, it's also sometimes difficult to get through. It's technical. I leave a lot of technical terms in the Latin, although I do put footnotes to them to try to get an explanation of what they mean, so you're not left like, well, great. Uh, it got to the point. It was in Latin. I don't know what it means now, <laughs> which is always a problem. Um, but you know, there's a lot of time you just have to leave it in Latin because there is no acceptable term or phrase in English that you could really use. So uh, sometimes you have consecrated, you know, phrases and things and ma makes it easier, but um, uh, delectatio amorosa, more amorosa delectation has been in the manuals in English for a while. So you can run that, you know, things of that sort, but. And, um, and his work's kind of important, especially for a salvation issue, right? Yeah. So basically, like, um, so all the things he covers is in the next volume, like I said, on the Ten Commandments, and then he gets to ecclesiastical precepts, and then he gets to the sacraments, like how the sacraments to be administered, when is it considered valid, invalid, what your moral obligations are, if you confer a sacrament, you later find it's invalid, all these sorts of things, right? So, all, and then he has other considerations too. So it's basically, it's a tool for the priest and the confessional to help the penitent determine whether they have sinned, if they have it, good, so if they got a scrupulous conscience, okay, you haven't sinned, and so here is the clarity for your conscience, or you have, so here's how to not do it. So it's a, so all of moral theology is a tool of mercy, right? So you have this kind of modern thing, of, well, we need to get back to the gospel, no more of this, this casuistry and all this stuff. Well, there's a fundamental injustice with that view. It's basically, it's, it's very much like when in the, in the right before the Reformation, Erasmus, in his arguments with uh, this Louvain doctor, Laudamus, he said that we need to throw away all scholastic theology. That's just useless. He hated scholasticism. And, and, and just go right back to the purity of the fathers. And Laudamus, who, one, also was, was doing a lot of work in the fathers, used them very frequently, um, said, well, you can't throw out the scholastics because they worked on all sorts of questions that, you know, the fathers had never even considered. So it's the same thing that um, has happened since Vatican II, is that the, the idea now kind of projected is this rubric. You've got to get rid of all these old cows. Now, granted, some of them are pretty miserable, dry, and, and annoying things that don't really promote knowledge of the faith without, without question. But, you know, as, as Blessed Pius IX says about uh, Alphonsus's moral theology, is it really is the jewel that, that rescued casuistry from kind of endless stupid propositions about whether this or that is an sin. It made it effective, useful, and, and beneficial. And so moral theology, it's not about loopholes, and it's not about rigidity. It's not about helping you find your ways out of sin or condemning you for sin. It's about helping the penitent and the priest together to get the soul to heaven by getting him to stop sinning, to cut away all these little areas where there isn't perfection. Yeah, it's a road and map. It, you, it, if, you, if you get off yeah. the road, someone's going to say, oh, you're being rigid by taking that. Well, you get lost. Yeah. And and, and this is why, and, and Alphonsus, what I really like about him, even though like a, a most modern thinkers would probably consider him to be, be a, um, horribly rigid, Alphonsus actually hated uh, rigidity in moral theology. And he hated laxism, but he hated rigidity more. He says that the priest who's lax and deals with his penitents in a, in a lax fashion, um, they their conscience will not be burdened with something that's a mortal sin, and they won't know, and therefore they won't be responsible. Right? The priest will be responsible, but they, you know, we won't be sending souls to hell. Whereas the rigid priest will be burdening the consciences of people with something that's a mortal sin when it's not. And as a result, they, when they break their conscience, because whatever it is is too hard, that, you know, they could end up being damned. 
right? So it puts the soul or, or fall into scrupulosity get even worse. So the, and the, the, the confessor's job, St. Alphonse says, is to find the balance between laxism and rigidity, right? And, and that's, that's what he aims to do, in of course, at least to the judgment of the tradition, is that he does. So Blessed Pius IX had declared that any priest could simply use Alphonsus's teaching in the moral theology or the condensed version of Homo Apostolicus, he could use that in the confessional without any recourse to any other author or any other thing. You know, which I, that's gold <laughs> right there. I mean, that the Pope, you know, it, it said, you just use him. That's all you need. You're good. Yeah. Why, you know, so. Some people like was uh, John Vianney and Pio, those, those guys used it, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so um, anyway, so with this now, I started this a couple of years ago, and it's been, I didn't even produce a volume last year. Yeah, and I think, I, did I do it the year before? I can't remember. I was gonna do it in 2019, got busy, and I got slowed down. I got like, I believe half or close to half, more than, a little more than half of it done. But the problem is the following. Ah, it's stupid, it's, it's pandering. But I'll just say it anyway. I was reading this book when uh, one, when um, my my uh, one of my daughters died, and so and I don't want to be like, oh, woo-hoo, give 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 for the bottom of your hearse. I just want to explain to people who have donated why it's taken me so long to actually get that third volume out. And that's basically, I mean, it was for like eight months. I didn't want to touch that book. Nothing to do with the book. It's stupid. It's just psychological. But there it is. Um, you know, that that's the reason why, in case anyone's wondering. So I'm not making excuses and I'm trying to go pander for money for that reason. But that's just the reality for those who are wondering, hey, where's volume three? I haven't seen volume three. And it's largely because just that emotional hang up. It wasn't even until a month ago that I finally actually translated some sentences, started to get over it. So I, it's just a weird thing with trauma. It's just, I just couldn't look at the book. And, and, it, and, it, and it's stupid. And I mentally know it is stupid. But you know, that's what happened. So we've made a lot of changes here at Mediatrix Express. We've uh, increased, I took on an employee. So, um, you know, so if you've corresponded with him, Scott, uh, managing editor, who's super awesome and has totally spruced up the website. And that's led a lot of things we've had to look at. So we're finally peering away just to double down on everything and kind of move forward. So the jet, so on these two projects, without a doubt, uh, this next volume of Bellarmine on the sacraments, baptism and confirmation will be available before Christmas, uh, without you know, without a doubt, that is the goal. That's what everything's moving toward. Whether I get another Opera Omnia volume out like that, the other parts of the Church Triumphant, it all depends on what the editors can do. I, I can't can't swear to that. I don't want to promise it. In the new year, it'd be good. I'd like to get that out of the way so I can hit up the Eucharist. Um, although then there's that. So after the sacraments, there's that last part of Bellarmine on um, original sin grace, justification, and good works, which is every bit as big as the volume I held up in the beginning. And the a lot of people are saying, hey, we want Bellarmine on justification. Why don't you excerpt that? You know, kind of like we excerpted, you know, purgatory and, uh, you know, church militant from the larger sections. And the issue there was, as I read through justification, when I finally finished off reading all of Bellarmine's controversies, I was getting through justification. I said, you know, almost all of this depends on what he says in, in the work De Grazia, as well as considerations on original sin. So because of that, it's not enough to read the book by itself and have a general understanding of what Catholic teaching is. There's really specific things on grace that deal with what he says. So I couldn't excerpt it. The whole thing just has to come out as one that way you can always have reference. So if you decide to skip ahead and it says, oh yeah, I see what was hidden De Grazia, you know, book two, chapter three, then it's like, okay, well, yeah, I can just go over here and do that. But you can't do it if I haven't translated yet. So that's why, and lots of people have been asking for it. So I'm seriously tempted in the beginning of next year to just go, to go into overdrive on getting that tome out and then go back to the sacraments. And I'm not sure. Um, I might do that. So my, I guess what, part of it will see if my mood is, but get it in one <laughs> or the other. <laughs> that's what always happens. I was looking at the treatise on the Eucharist and it's like, oh boy, because <laughs> there's so many distinctions. Got to go really slow to make sure we're parsing all the technical terminology out correctly and whatnot. So, and, um, and, and then the state of the laity in the church, so we always complain about nobody knows much about the, what the church teaches. So yeah. do yourselves a favor, get the apologetics book. I mean, there's plenty of apologetics books out there now. If it weren't for this guy, 
they would be a Scott Hahn, a Tim Staples, things like right. that. This guy was the top dog. The the he was the he was the he was the guy, grand poobah of this. <laughs> In fact, if you look at various arguments that, um, like Dr. Hahn came up with, that um, a lot of the, like you find in like Catholic Answers tracts and whatnot, they essentially trace their origins from Bellarmine. Mm -hmm. When you get down to it, that's where they they ultimately derive from, where they came in other books which they read uh, or not. I mean, I know Dr. Hahn's Latin is very good. I don't know that he's read Bellarmine or not, but um, nevertheless, I mean, years ago it was very good. So, I I, I, um, I have a hard time imagining he hasn't at least looked at it once in the Latin or something so anyway um that's that so another book we did this year is uh bellarmine on the mass mm -hmm. especially all you traditionalists he's defending your mass <laughs> from the protestants and so it's actually a great read um theologically you know very good it goes into the, the whole notion of what a sacrifice is yeah and, and of course we're doing a separate series on the same channel on that subject so you can stay tuned for more of those but anyway um, you know, so all of this works are really good, but it's it's a it's a big tool uh, as it takes invests a lot of time. You know, I can out of that big massive book, I can do about a page and a half an hour if I'm really going. And uh, but there's still when there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours that are going into it. And and so that's why we have um, the project asking for donations and such things. Um, and to help that go along, to help with various expenses. This time I'm not putting other books into circulation and it's money that's going to editors too. They used to get volunteer editors. They're all good folks, but I just didn't have enough people putting enough eyes on things. So I have to pay uh, other people. And that's, uh, you know, because things still snuck through. So that's why I need to stop errors and typos from sneaking through. And that's, that's the main thing. And so, so donations go to that and the, um, you know, it's not just money. I'm just pocketing to go off for, uh, you know, tobacco and alcohol and such. So. <laughs> yes. And we'll have uh, links yeah. underneath in the show notes to be able to donate directly to the project. And if you don't want to donate and just want to buy it, especially for the mor uh, moral theology, yeah. you people that have priests as sons, uh, friends, if you say you care about them, I think you might want to get them that book and have them read it. Seminaries. This is kind of this local action we keep talking about. Think locally, act locally. Fix, help out with your local priests. Get all your priests in your diocese the books. Get your seminaries the books. That right there will help create better priests in the future. The uh, yeah, and you know, and that's that's the thing is you you need a Christmas gift for your priest. Get him Alphonsus's moral theology. You know, and if uh, you need a you know a gift, you get a priest that you think would benefit all souls days coming up. And so what better than a book defending purgatory, you know, priest or seminarian or someone, or you got, you, you know, even you got a friend who's, and you just see him arguing on uh, uh, Facebook or something of that sort or Twitter and say, well, well how does it purgatory? What, where's purgatory in scripture? Again, just, uh, just leave a plug to the book. I, I think mean, it's the only the English. You could do it off Amazon, but we get do a little better if you do it off the website. I think it's so, the only English apologetic work on purgatory out there, right? It may or may not be. I don't want to claim that without having looked into it. It's certainly one of, I believe, the only translation of a major text in the church's tradition on it. And it's frankly fairly exhausted mm -hmm. in all the subjects. One, the scripture, and the scriptural exegesis is just fantastic. His marshalling of the fathers on that subject. Um, that was just brilliant, and then, and then he even deals with the speculative questions, things that are not dogma, de fide, but synthesizes again what so many of the theologians say about purgatory and what's what's more serious. And he gives some references to some other works, which actually I found on Google Books, and so I downloaded those. So I've got those to look at in the future when I'm, when I'm not busy with all this stuff. So and you, and you guys get um, bulk discounts, right? Yeah, uh, yes, well, we, we do um, we kind of by request, uh, and then we do wholesale discounts. So if you're a bookstore, you want to get these in, you need to contact us for, for wholesale books uh, discounts. We try really hard to to make that equitable so the bookstore can make some money because we're not Amazon. <laughs> and we don't like particularly much of Amazon, even though it's kind of a necessary evil so much. Uh, I want those Catholic brick and mortars to survive, so, so we try to... Um, although in the age of COVID, it's, uh, it might take us a little bit of time to get you books because we don't always have the quantities on hand. And then, you know, it's like um, whatever nonsense is going on somewhere. And then it's like, oh, this is going to take 24 days. It's like, why is it going to take so long? 
Um, but there it is. And so I don't know. I don't know why it's going to take so long. So anyways, every once in a while we run into that sort of thing. But then it'll ship another like 10 or 15 books of something in like uh, three or four days. Yeah, I got one. And the last I, one I, I ordered from you. I got it pretty quick. I'm oh, good. Yeah. I think it was within about like three or four days. Because a bulk, we'll, we'll special order the stuff in bulk for, for bookstores and whatnot. So because uh, we usually don't have massive quantities here. Right. So, so but that's just how can people contact you? We'll put the uh, link underneath, but just so that they can hear it, too. Yeah. So you get to the website, www.mediatrixpress.com. There is uh, info at Mediatrix Express. And don't forget to leave the um, the donation scales. And by the way, that's one thing I got to mention um, is that we're changing some of the donation scales we had in the past on the Bellarmine project. So we are eliminating the because it used to be you gave twenty dollars, you got all the ebooks. We're actually getting rid of that. But then there's a whole mass of people that donated to us in the past. So their grandfather did. So if you're watching this, you're like, hey, I gave 20 bucks. He's not cutting me off, is he? Like, no, no, your grandfather didn't. Don't worry about it. But in, in, in the future, though, it's just uh, just kind of the nature of the beast to try to get this work moving and, and to maximize, um, especially, you know, payments to editors and so many other things. So. Very good. Ryan, man, you know, I tell everybody you're the hardest working person out there that not that many people know about. So God bless you for it. Hopefully <laughs> well, uh, people true. can help you out and get these works out there because God knows we need it. And uh, yeah, man, thanks a lot. Thank you.